Hello everyone. I hope you're having a great week. This video will go over chapter 11, which talks about some of the main tactics of persuasive writing. Now, one of the most widely used forms of persuasion comes from Aristotle, a famous philosopher, and his art of persuasion talks about three distinct qualities of persuasive speech or writing in our case. The first is ethos, and ethos talks about the qualities of the speaker. This includes building your credibility, likability, um, all of the things that uh, involve a speaker and the person sharing the message. So for us as writers, this could be anything from us as an individual writer, we could be talking about the brand that we're writing for, such as the news organization or our client that we're selling for. So there are many uh, aspects to consider within ethos. Logos in Aristotle's Art of Persuasion deals primarily with logic. So here we're talking about facts. What are the reasoning uh, qualities that can get someone to be persuaded to your side? Uh, what are some of the things that you discuss that help meet an actual need? And so uh, Logos really is about the logic behind the argument that you're trying to make. Pathos or pathos in the art of persuasion is really dealing with the emotional aspects of persuasion. What kind, how are you drawn to the arguments? How are you feeling about those arguments? Does hearing a certain side make you very angry? And what do you do with that anger? Um, can you make someone feel bad for not participating? So um, the, that's the three main points of the art of persuasion. So if we're looking at a single uh, campaign, in this case, uh, sh sugary drinks and their effect on your heart health. Uh, the American Heart Association and others have done many types of campaigns that use one of these three arts of persuasion. So in terms of ethos, uh, they're actually attacking the credibility of big soda or the soda industry by saying, don't let big soda sugarcoat the facts, take back your health. And then it provides some details about how um, the soda industry is, is actually manipulating some of the facts behind uh, the healthiness of those drinks. So here um, we are attacking the credibility of a subject and therefore that really relates to ethos. Uh, we're using a very well-known brand logo for the American Heart Association, which provides some credibility to this message given their uh, expertise in the field. On the right here, you can see um, a, a GIF, a, a movable graphic um, that talks about the logic or facts behind sugary drinks. So um, here we have a couple of facts that kind of pop through, such as sugary drinks contribute to overweight and obesity, including 42 million children. So that's a fact, it's a statistic. And so it contributes to the logic of the argument. Uh, in terms of pathos, um, stop sugary drinks from hooking our kids. We would never want that kind of hook to be in our children. Seeing that and thinking about that near our children um, makes us feel like our children could be in danger. It makes us scared. And so we want to, the idea would be that you want to get behind any platform that would keep that from happening. So here's an example of how three different campaigns have really drawn upon these three aspects of the art of persuasion. However, the key to Aristotle's art of persuasion is that it usually involves overlapping multiple aspects of ethos, logos, and pathos. So here, for example, we have kids have enough sugary drinks each year to fill a bathtub, which by the way, these are true statistics. Um, but here we have a fact about how much sugar kids consume in a year, but it's really kind of emotional because it's tying in the visualization of how much that is. There, it, this ad is meant to make you feel guilty about how much sugary drinks a child consumes. 
so that you will work to combat it. And so here you can see we've kind of combined uh, those two uh, aspects of persuasion to create a pretty effective campaign. Semiotics is another type of persuasive appeal. Uh, all of these are called heuristics. Heuristics are tools that you can use um, to uh, communicate persuasion. Uh, semiotics means the meaning of words through signs. So it, it is interpreting signs, which can be verbal, written, nonverbal. Any form of communication can be a sign through which the audience can generate meaning. Semiotics is important because it helps us understand the potential impact that our message can have on our receivers. It's us trying to figure out what the symbols of our work mean to the general public and to people outside of our own circles so that we ensure that we're not um, communicating something that we don't mean to. And in the reverse, that we are using symbols that will best speak to what we mean. Um, so a signifier is the form of communication. Again, this can be verbal, can be written, it can be nonverbal. Um, and the signified is the meaning that is associated with that signifier or that sign. And so here uh, you can see the V symbol being thrown up with the hands. Now, if I did this in class, you know, in front of you guys, you guys would think I was talking about peace because now the meaning that is associated with it, the signified is peace, probably because of the 60s and 70s, right? But actually the original use of the Vs with your finger is a nonverbal form of talking about victory day. And so uh, signs and symbols can change over time. And it's important that we as communicators continue to understand how these uh, symbols and semiotics is working in today's society. So here's an example. If I were going to write a story on um, legislation that possibly restricts the types of guns that someone can own, what would I call it? There are many different things that we as a writer could label the story as, right? And I've listed some to the left. Well, each of these uh, symbols, each of these words have meaning outside of what we're actually talking about. Because if you're talking about gun control to someone who believes that everyone has the right to carry, control makes it sound very restrictive, like you are taking away someone's rights. And then that person might be more combative to the idea of whatever you're talking about. Where others, if you're talking, let's say, to the victim of gun violence about your gun rights, that sounds very harsh in terms of the human life that is right in front of you. So choosing what words you're going to use to frame your communication are very important because your word choice has real impact. It has real meaning. And so think about what types of symbols and meanings you're communicating with the words you choose. But like we said, there doesn't have to be any words for you to communicate anything. And what you mean to say may, be, may not be how something is interpreted. For instance, um, in this Bud Light commercial on the far left, we see the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. Now, the industry execs at Budweiser said that this was meant to, you know, encourage a carefree and kind of, you know, spur of the moment entertainment feel. But... Obviously, a lot of people thought that this was contributing to rape culture by trying to remove no from the vocabulary and saying, I'm up for whatever, um, and the perfect beer for whatever happens, right? And so they did not consider the alternative uh, meanings for their phrasing. Um, the picture on the in the middle is from a clothing company that put a coolest monkey in the jungle shirt on this black boy. And of course, we know that there are many stereotypes and historical racism involving African-Americans being um, 
related to primates, which is extremely offensive. And so they, the company did not consider the implications of these symbols and the meanings that they were using. Um, and the same with this ad on the right, where Dove, who actually promotes beauty inclusivity for all, um, was talking about washing away dirt and had a black woman model take away her shirt to reveal a white woman underneath wearing a white shirt. Um, and it, it talked about um, cleanliness. And again, this goes back to uh, some racial history of soap using African-American models to talk about how unclean and undesirable uh, the color of their skin was. And so this was a real misstep in terms of the visual uh, semiotics that were being used in these campaigns. Social judgment theory is another theory of persuasion that we can use at, as writers. Uh, social judgment theory by Sharef uh, talks about how people filter messages through a set of comparisons to determine their position on a given message. You uh, process information through social judgment theory all the time. Uh, for example, if I say that uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide is the best football team in the nation, well, depending upon your level of fandom for the Alabama Crimson Tide, you are either going to accept that and integrate my proof that they are the best football team ever uh, into your life, and you're going to continue to, to move forward with that. Where if you're, say, an Auburn fan, then you're going to generate all kinds of counter arguments to what I'm saying and reject my message. And then, of course, there are going to be people like me who actually would reject my own message because I just don't care. Uh, I'm non-committal in terms of football. I don't have a huge fandom. And so therefore, I'll likely neutrally take in your information. So at, when we're writing, we need to consider all three buckets, right? And the latitudes of acceptance, non-commitment, and rejection to be able to overcome a lot of these. The hope is that you assimilate people into your persuasion as opposed to creating a contrasting effect. Now, it's really important with these three types of persuasion, as well as the motivational appeals that we're about to talk about, that we consider ethics within persuasion. Because as a communicator, as a media writer, you have the ability and the power to persuade things people about all types of things. And so we really need to practice ethical persuasion where we're using our power for good and doing it in a way that is not manipulative to the public. Because we should always be upholding public trust and utilizing our own ethical and moral boundaries from a personal level, you as a good person, and then also making sure that our actions align within the professional boundaries of ethics. You know, the um, Public Relations Society of America, uh, PRSA, has a very broad code of ethics um, that provides some guidance here. Uh, other organizations such as the AAF or the IABC also have their own codes of ethics. But really, we, we need to be balancing the needs of our clients to the way that the audience will react and making sure that we're doing all of that within our own personal and professional ethical boundaries. So another key thing to remember with these persuasion tactics is that doesn't mean that you're not considering your SAM and your fascia um, as you're writing. These always need to be your first steps because in order to know how to persuade and knowing um, kind of the starting point of your message, you need to understand the situation and audience. Then you need to know what you're really doing. Are you just trying to share facts? Because that's going to look a lot differently persuasively than others. Um, versus trying to get someone to do an action, that's obviously the hardest thing to persuade someone to do. So in order to do analysis first, it's critical that we first understand our audience. And our audience can be many different people. 
Uh, especially in public relations, you're likely dealing uh, or advertising, you're likely dealing with a client, you're dealing with customers, you're dealing with your own internal team with your firm, and you're dealing with media partners. And so you have to ask yourselves, what are their motivations? What are their needs? What's going on in their lives? And how can I make that better, easier, or more fun for them? And so those are some key things to consider before you start trying to persuade someone with your writing. Another thing that you want to think about is um, think about the audience's current understanding so that you can then generate strategies that will target them help meet a demand of theirs. That's the best way to persuade someone to take action and then create executable steps. How will you get them to take that action? Um, so in order to write well and write at the proper time, you have to consider the situation. That means knowing your audience and all of this comes from pre-campaign research. I cannot stress enough how important this is. In public relations, we often talk about rope as a strategy. It means that we should first be doing research. We should cr be creating measurable objectives for our campaign. Then we do the writing and then we go back and evaluate our writing for um, meeting the objectives and meeting the findings of our research. Now Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this is really fuzzy, I apologize, but this is um, another theory that talks about that all people have various level of needs in their lives. Obviously, on the most basic level, on the bottom of our pyramid, we have our physiological needs, such as needing air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and the ability to reproduce and, and create more of us um, so that we can continue living as a um, species. And so meeting these physiological needs tend to be the most important. If someone does not have one of these needs met, then they will not worry about anything above that on the pyramid. They will first have to work on the physiological needs uh, to ensure that those are met. Next comes safety. That's the second most important thing in people's lives. And this can be everything from your personal safety, your security, employment, resources, health, property. If you can uh, speak to one of these needs, that can be very effective in terms of having someone do what you're wanting them to do. Love and belonging uh, tends to be third, kind of middle in this area. We all want to feel love. We all want to feel like we belong. And so a lot of ads actually target this area um, to allow for kind of that relational connection. Esteem is finding respect, getting status, recognition, strength, freedom from something. Um, and this can be very important in our lives as well. Self-actualization is the desire to be the most that one can be. And it's rare for us to ever be able to actually meet this need, but it's something we're constantly striving for. So in thinking about those needs, here are the motive appeals that your textbook talks about. And we need to think about these motive appeals in terms of how they meet the various needs on the hierarchy, right? So like satisfying physical needs, basic needs like um, food, shelter, water, those are really important because on the Maslow hierarchy of needs, those are on the bottom most, making them the most important. So that's a really important motive appeal. Safety would also be important. Remember, that's the second level of needs, you know, uh, being able to have sex. But in our culture, we tend to not think of sex in that bottom most rung of um, meeting reproduction needs. We usually are thinking about sex in terms of uh, love and belonging, that middle one. However, sometimes you could, of course, be referring to the bottom rung. Affiliation is belonging and care. Nurturing is taking care of others. Guidance is getting help. Aggress is when you're taking bold action to make something happen or make a big change in your life. Uh, achieve means that you're obtaining some kind of goal. Dominant means that you have the desire to control. Prominence means that you want your reputation to be in good standing. 
Attention means you want to be noticed. Autonomy means you want to be able to take care of yourself um, and not have to rely on other people. Escape can be either a physical escape, uh, like a vacation, getting away from something, or it can be a mental escape, uh, just kind of brainless entertainment. We typically all have a need for aesthetic sensations, which tend to be done through artistic means, and then also satisfying curiosities, such as answering those burning questions in our lives. So we can use motive appeals in our writing to meet the needs of our audience. Remember, we should have done some research to kind of understand what those needs of our audience would be and how our product or our campaign can help them with that need. So let's take Southwest famous want to get away um, slogan. So what types of motive appeals does this ad speak to? Well, obviously, if people want to get away, they want to escape. So that would be meeting one of those motive appeals. But we saved you a seat. You know, that's affiliation. It's belonging. You're wanted by the company. Uh, it's guidance. You know, they are helping you find um, low fares. They're helping you by being uh, transparency or transparent in the way that they do their, their pricing. Uh, so they're providing you guidance. Uh, same with safety. They talk about low fares, nothing to hide. That's transparency. Uh, so it's generating trust with the client. And attention, you want to be noticed. So we saved you a seat. So you are being noticed by the Southwest. They have actually gone and saved you an individual seat. Now, have they actually done that? No, but that's the need that they're hoping to meet through the semiotics that they chose. What about this ad or PSA? You smoke, your child smokes. Take your smoke outside. By the time he is six years old, your child will have inhaled the equivalent of 102 packs of cigarettes. So this obviously talks about safety, which is one of the prime human needs. It's on the bottom part of that pyramid, remember? Nurturing is to take care of others. So by targeting not your smoking habit and how it affects your health, they're talking about how it affects your kids. So that actually uh, tends to be a lot more persuasive than trying to convince smokers that their health is in jeopardy. And also it's providing you um, some guidance on how to get help. They're offering a suggestion of how to prevent that. Take your smoke outside, right? So uh, that, those are some examples of ads or PSAs that have used motive appeals. Now Monroe's motivated sequence also provides some actionable steps in our writing. The first is to get our audience's attention we do this through what's called an AGD or an attention getting device. This can be, you know, an emotional story, a shocking example, dramatic statistics, quotes, things like that. So think back to the, like those days of public speaking when you needed to grab the audience's attention. We need to do that in our writing as well. A need is how does it relate to the audience's needs? Think Maslow again. Uh, and the need won't go away by itself. The audience needs to take an action to resolve this need that they have. Satisfaction means that you can solve the issue with whatever campaign or advertisement that you are providing the audience. Visualization is letting them know what would happen if the solution is implemented or doesn't take place. What would the new world look like? Help them visualize that, either through words or with actual visuals. And then action is really important because it tells the audience what action they can personally take to solve the issue. So here's an example of a PSA. It's obviously satire. Um, and so I think that's really interesting in using humor in this PSA to uh, promote healthy school lunches. And plus, who doesn't love Nick Offerman? The government tells us we need to offer healthy choices and school lunches, but what is healthy, really? Is it this, or is it this? The answer may surprise you. Welcome to the Pizza Farm, where we are hard at work growing the ripe, juicy pizzas your kids love. 
What could be healthier than this? Acres of pizza kissed by the sun, stretching as far as the eye can see. Mmm. Fresh pepperoni straight from Mother Earth. We also have orchards of taquito trees soaking up the minerals and vitamins from the sun before we pick them and deliver them straight to those school lunch trays. Can I have one? You sure you don't want an apple? Ew, no way. <laughs> Here you go. You see, kids know what their bodies need. My teeth feel soft. Go away. These fields produce hot, moist, sloppy joes all year round. Yeah. Thanks to the nutrients and the cola we use to water them. Oh, like mother's milk. We all want our kids to eat healthy, all-natural food. So stop pushing gross fruits and vegetables on them and let them dig into a fresh-picked bushel of hot, flaky fish fingers. Yeah, they keep falling off. We can't get these to stick on the branches. So... I'm, I'm sorry. Listen, if it's on a plant, it's good for you. Who cares how it got there? French fries are practically salads, which is why I like mine with ranch. So the American Heart Association partnered with Funny or Die and Nick Offerman to provide this satire uh, and encourage people to think about healthier lunches for schools. So what's the attention getter? Well, the parody, the, the humor, the pizza farm is the attention getter there. What needs are we talking about? The physical needs of children's health, their safety. It speaks to our nurture motivation appeal. Um, Satisfaction is that better school lunches are needed. Uh, they are healthier. We need to produce food or give them food that are, is produced on a real farm. Uh, the visualization is like those kids with soft teeth or uh, having to um, staple fish sticks to a, a plant. And then the action is visit the website and they provide a hashtag for it. But, you know, I think something that this uh, piece could have done better was provide a better call to action. What should the audience do after they watch this? There's really not a great call to action here, such as sign this petition, you know, visit our website or anything like that. It doesn't really ask the audience to really do anything. Um, so that's where the action kind of falls short on the motivated sequence. And we as writers could then suggest an edit or a rewrite to this to make it better. So that's the process of using persuasive techniques within your writing. Uh, so you're gonna do your second writing assignment uh, on persuasive writing techniques. That will be due Thursday, September 24th at midnight. And then I want you to focus on uh, AP style numerals. Uh, first read the section, watch the video, and the homework will be due on Tuesday.